The Future is Calling Us to Greatness is the main program that I have been delivering throughout 2014 along the route of the Great March for Climate Action. It's the main evening program that I've been delivering. The Great March for Climate Action began in Los Angeles on March 1st and ended on November 1st in Washington, D.C., and Connie and I spoke at about 100 uh, churches and colleges along that route, mostly churches. And it was about 50 people full-time that did the whole 3,000-mile stretch, and others joined major um, cities. I, I ended up, I mean, these people were suffering in some of this. Um, I ended up speaking at several of the rallies along the route. And um, anyway, this was, this was the major thing that I did, uh, that Connie and I both did throughout 2014. It was a great honor to march with this sign, Climate Change is the Moral Issue, with Ed Fallon, who's right there walking with the walking stick next to me, and the, the woman to, uh, on the left of me in this picture, the one in the purple, uh, was Mayor Miriam, and um, she walked every, every mile, and she was um, 71 years old. So that's what gave structure to this. So the future is calling us to greatness, right relationship to reality in the 21st century and beyond. The other title that I sometimes used or supplemented it with was The Reality is Lord, a scientific view of God and why this matters on a rapidly warming planet. I will use the words God and reality interchangeably. I'll make the case why it's not only legitimate to do that, but why it's important for religious people to do that. Um, I did a TEDx talk back in May of 2014 called Reality Reconciles Science and Religion, and all that content is also included in this program. There are many different paths to living in right relationship to reality, of course. There's no one way. The path that I'm particularly passionate about, Connie and I both, is the path of factual faith or sacred realism. We're both religious naturalists. There are many ways to think or speak about God. There's as many religious or theological ways as there are traditions. There are a number of philosophical ways. Most famously, Paul Tillich spoke of God as the ground of all being. Uh, there are many psychological ways of thinking and speaking about God. What I will be offering isn't really any of that. It's, it includes much of that, but what I'm offering, what I'm suggesting, what I'm claiming is that this is the one scientific evidential way that we can speak about God. In other words, stepping back and looking at how God talk has been used throughout human history and all, all over the world, what can we say with confidence about God talk, religious language in that regard? My great mentor, Thomas Berry, died a few years ago at the age of 94. He called himself a geologian, not a theologian, but a geologian. And this quote just helps set the context for this program. We are talking only to ourselves. We are not talking to the rivers. We are not listening to the wind and the climate. Most of the disasters that are happening now are a consequence of that spiritual autism. Another Barry, Wendell Berry, uh, really understood the power of personification. He gets this. Uh, the two are not related that I know of. Wendell Berry said, Nature is party to all our deals and decisions, and she has more votes, a longer memory, and a sterner sense of justice than we do. Now, I'll come back to this theme of personification. It's just so vital. I consider it the single most important scientific discovery about religion in the last 100 years, that our brains inherently personify. We relate. We have relational brains, and we've done that traditionally through personification. That is giving human characteristics to what's other than human or more than human. Uh, and Hollywood is starting to get, the, starting to get it. Uh, just, in, just very recently, Conservation International came out with a series of videos uh, with Hollywood big guns, big stars, giving voice to various aspects of uh, reality, of nature. Here's one example. You'll, uh, you'll recognize the voice, I'm sure. Some call me nature. Others call me Mother Nature. I've been here for over four and a half billion years. 22,500 times longer than you. I don't really need people, but people need me. Yes, your future depends on me. When I thrive, you thrive. When I falter, you falter. Or worse.
but I've been here for eons. I have fed species greater than you, and I have starved species greater than you. My oceans, my soil, my flowing streams, my forests, they all can take you or leave you. How you choose to live each day, whether you regard or disregard me, doesn't really matter to me. One way or the other, your actions will determine your fate, not mine. I am nature. I will go on. I am prepared to evolve. Are you? So natureisspeaking.org is where you can find these uh, other videos as well. Each of them is about a minute and a half to two minutes long. I'll be sharing one more. That, of course, was Julia Roberts speaking as, as uh, nature. I'll be sharing one more here just in a little bit. Just a little background. My wife, Connie Barlow, is a science writer. She's written four science books, From Gaia to Selfish Genes and Evolution Extended, are both MIT press books. The Ghosts of Evolution was Amazon.com's top recommended science book when it first came out in 2001 for several months. And Green Space, Green Time, The Way of Science, you could say The Spirituality of Science. It's one of the leading books, uh, one of the, the most respected books in the whole field of religious naturalism. My background, Michael Dowd is my name, my background is in Christian ministry, uh, although I did have, I pastored three churches over the course of a decade, although I did have one foot in the Unitarian Universalist Association during that whole time. I was a member of the Church of the Larger Fellowship. I've also done sustainability and transformational education, and I've written two books, Earth Spirit back in 1990 and my more recent book, Thank God for Evolution. And um, the book I'm working on now uh, and will complete in uh, 2015 uh, is really the content of this program. Connie and I have been living on the road since April of 2002, and you can probably see the side of our van there. We've got the Jesus and Darwin fish kissing with hearts between them. Definitely gets us some interesting looks in conservative parts of the world. Um, it also has gotten us some interesting press. For example, the New York Times Magazine did a feature article on my book, and um, I was on CNN Lou Dobbs, and here I am on, uh, on Fox and Friends on Sunday morning. Now, my mother, who only watches Fox News, was watching, so I was pretty pleased. Um, but at the beginning, they were rather skeptical, and after five minutes, they were like, well, thank God for evolution. That's a book whose time has come. Now, this is Fox News, so I was pretty pleased. We've spoken to about 2,000 groups, just over 2,000 groups over the last 12 and a half years, and they break down into radically different populations. And I can do the exact same program in any of these settings. And I know from experience, we actually handed out feedback forms for about three and a half years, um, that about 90% of the people are going to enjoy my program, and many think that it's just fabulous. And that's, I think, because we focus on the, the sacred side of science, the, the inspiring side of what's being revealed evidentially. I'll be talking a little bit more about what Religion 1.0 and Religion 2.0 are in a few minutes here, but Religion 3.0 is, is, is not a religion. It's a set of values, priorities, and commitments that are uniting tens of millions of religious and secular people around the world, and they really hover around two core commitments. The commitment to live in right relationship to reality, whether we use secular or religious names for reality, and the need to co-create a just and healthy future. In fact, I think, really, the, the second one is the primary one. Co-creating a just and healthy future is our, is our first and primary commitment, and living in right relationship to reality is the only way that we can do that and have joy in the process. And people across the godism spectrum, from theist to atheist and everything in between, in fact, that middle term uh, Connie and I created as a bridge-building term, you can pronounce it creatheist or creatheist. Um, uh, I've also heard it described as mythiest, that is, all God talk is mythic, and that's a positive thing, that's not a negative thing. Naturalist and supernaturalist align with these two principles. Skeptics, humanists, and free thinkers, of course, but also moderate to liberal people in all, or virtually all, religious traditions. And I know that because I've spoken in all these groups. I've also been, throughout 2014, interviewing just the cream of the crop, literally. Uh, I've interviewed 55 of the world's uh, top thinkers and actors and activists 
on peak oil, climate change, sustainability, and a few religious leaders that help us hold this inspiring stuff in inspiring ways. And so this airs in, uh, in uh, late January, but I've been, that's also been by this title, The Future is Calling Us to Greatness. Right relationship to reality is what has always mattered for all species. Any species that doesn't live in right relationship to reality goes extinct, period, and humans are no different. And words create worlds. That is, the world views that we live and move and have our being within are created by the language that we use, co-created by the language that we use. And this changes over the centuries. Oh, and I'm, I'm just now reminded that all of the photos that you'll be seeing, other than the few galaxy shots, but other, other than that, all the photos Connie has taken as we've traveled North America over the last uh, 12 and a half years. So words create worlds, and language changes over the centuries. What we call reality, what we call nature, what we call the environment and climate and weather, the ancients personalized. They had an I-thou relationship to. They called God, or if you lived in a polytheistic culture, the gods. And we don't merely believe this. We know this. The evidence is compelling. I'll do a whole piece on that here in a few minutes. Whatever else it means to live in right relationship to reality, it's got to include living in right relationship with the air, the water, the soil, and the life of this planet. It's also got to include living in right relationship to future generations. Besides, I love showing off my, my granddaughter. So I dedicate this program to Isla Renee and to her grandchildren. Loyal Rue is one of the world's uh, most significant philosophers of religion, and he's written a number of books. Uh, this one uh, is a, called Religion is Not About God, and what he means is that religion is about our relationship to reality. And yes, reality has been personified as the various gods and goddesses, but if religion's doing its job, what it's supposed to do is help us live in right relationship to what's fundamentally, undeniably, inescapably real. I love this quote. He said, the most profound insight in the history of humanity is that we should seek to live in accord with reality. Indeed, living in harmony with reality may be accepted as a formal definition of wisdom. If we live at odds with reality, foolishly, then we will be doomed. But if we live in right relationship with reality, wisely, then we will be saved. And he goes on to say that all cultures have had at least a tacit understanding of this fundamental principle. But what we're less in agreement about is how we should think about reality and what we should do to put ourselves into harmony or alignment with reality. But that makes total sense when you realize these two fundamental questions, what's real or how things are, and what's important or which things matter, would have been answered differently at different times in history and different places around the world. I mean, it's like the five blind men or the five blind women, five blind people experiencing the elephant. You know, if you've got five blind people that are each experiencing a different aspect of reality, different aspect of the elephant, if you had five different theologians, you'd have five totally different theologies. And believe it or not, religious differences are not more, a whole lot more complex than that. Reality, for example, 100,000 years ago in a band or family in South Africa is very different than, say, reality 50,000 years ago in a tribe. Then you get a bunch of tribes interacting. They face some crisis, some challenge, some chaos, some difficulty. They figure out how to align the self-interests of each tribe with a new level of complexity and a chiefdom or a kingdom emerges. And then you get a bunch of chiefdoms and kingdoms interacting. This is how the world has become as complex as it is. And all the world's religious traditions reflect regional collective intelligence about what's real and what's important. But what we now need isn't just regional collective intelligence. We don't need just tribal collective intelligence. We don't need our best globally produced answers to what's real and what's important. And that's what science is. You don't understand science if you think it's just another language game. The postmodernists have it wrong on this. Science reflects humanity's global collective intelligence. You've got Christian scientists, Buddhist scientists, Hindu scientists, atheist scientists, scientists of all religious traditions and no religious tradition, and even anti-religious scientists that are all contributing to our best collective understanding of what's real and what's important, or how things are, and which things matter. Now this begs the question, what's religion? Is religion just supernatural otherworldlyism, as some uh, criticize? I suggest to you no. Oh, by the way, this is me. You can see at the bottom there. This is Deer Creek Falls in the Grand Canyon. This actually goes up 140 feet. Uh, Connie and I rafted for a week down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon with a bunch of geologists and, and science people from the National Center for Science Education uh, about four years ago. It was fabulous. But religions are mythic maps of what's real and what's important. And when I say mythic, they personify, usually unconsciously, but they have an I-thou personal relationship with reality. Also, all religions produce personal wholeness and social coherence. There's no religion in the world that doesn't consistently produce personal wholeness and social coherence 
and all religions provide consistent access to the feeling states that humans have always needed to thrive. Human beings don't thrive. We can't thrive if all we can do is look to the future with fear. We can only thrive when we can look to the future with trust, including trusting that we're not going to be here forever. We're going to die. Different religions have different beliefs that get people to trust, but they all get us there. Same thing. We can't thrive as human beings if all we can do is look to the past with resentment or guilt or bitterness. We can only thrive when we can look to our past with gratitude. In fact, now we have secular ways. Therapy is in large part a secular way of helping us to find something to be grateful for where before all we had was guilt or resentment or bitterness. And same thing. We can't thrive as human beings. We don't thrive if we're overwhelmed by the challenges of the day. We can only thrive when we're inspired to be in action, whatever the challenges may be. You know, because as we all know, compost happens. I mean, just life just throws us piles of junk to deal with sometimes. So how do we stay inspired to be in action, whatever the challenges are? Well, all religions, through different belief systems, get us to trust, gratitude, and inspiration. We didn't have knowledge that can get us there. We've, we only had beliefs until recently. We now have knowledge that we can all agree on, but not in a way that disses religion, but in a way that helps re the religious traditions themselves to evolve. Now, I did a program a couple of years ago where I actually was asked by a Christian congregation in Canada to, this was filled with a bunch of scientists, you know, how can we use God talk in a way that's totally, can we use God talk in a way that's accurate scientifically? And you know that Tina Turner song, What's Love Got to Do With It? So I, I, I created my own version, so humor me here. What's God got to do, got to do with it? What's God but an ancient mythic notion? What's God got to do, got to do with it? Who needs Poseidon, plate tectonics, make the ocean? <laughs> so I know, a little corny, but that's what we're going to talk about now, is what's God got to do with it? Now, if you lived in the Pacific Northwest, say, 500 years ago, and there was this huge boulder in the middle of a field, no other mountains anywhere nearby, what would your, what would your people, your tribe, your culture, what, what story or stories would be told about how that boulder got there? I mean, anything this weird or this cool or this interesting demands a story. So not having a story simply wasn't an option. And my hunch is, God did it would have been the way virtually any culture would have talked about it. Or the goddess or great spirit, but some divine entity. And then some story would be told about how God put it there. Well, in the 1930s and 40s, J. Harlan Bretz, a geologist, uh, started noticing these interesting geological features in the Pacific Northwest. And now there's no geologist in the world that would, de that would debate how that boulder got there in eastern Washington. Because 17 times the glaciers came south and the glaciers went back. Talk about climate change. Seven, just in the last two and a half million years, 17 times. And when the glaciers came south, they blocked the Clark Fork River, which is right at the top of that uh, image there, creating Glacial Lake Missoula. And it filled up this enormous lake that was almost as large as Lake Superior in terms of water volume. And when it was filled to the brim, it would break the ice dam. And within 48 hours, all of this water would rush to the Pacific Ocean. And it would, these icebergs would carry boulders and drop them along the way. The water got caught in the Willamette Valley south of Portland, Oregon, and it couldn't, it couldn't uh, where Portland is now, and couldn't get out. So it dropped a lot of silt, which is why the Willamette Valley to this day is one of the most fertile valleys in the world. And this happened dozens of times. So... 500 years ago, how'd that boulder get there? God did it. Well, 60, 70 years ago, geologists started saying, God didn't do it. It happened through natural causes. And what we can now finally appreciate is these are different ways of saying basically the same thing. The words God and evolution are both pointing to the same divine creative process. Both answer the question, how did we get here? How did everything get here? One uses the mythic or relational language of religion. The other uses the literal or empirical language of science. Arguing whether it was God or evolution that created everything is like debating whether it's Uncle Sam or the U.S. government that insists we pay taxes every year. Or like quarreling over whether it was Gaia or plate tectonics that created the oceans and the mountains. Such silly and largely unnecessary confusion will remain the norm until we get and celebrate, again, what I consider to be the most important discovery about religion in the last hundred years, which is personification. James Hillman, the famous psychologist, said it this way. He said, loving is a way of knowing, and for love to know, it must personify. Personifying is thus the heart's mode of knowing. It's not a lesser, primitive way of apprehending, but a finer one. To enter myth, we must personify. And to personify carries us into myth. Now, he's using the word myth not as an untrue story, but the way that Joseph Campbell used the term, a narrative that puts us in accord with the nature of reality. 
Personification, as it turns out, is necessary. It's vital for understanding the world's myriad myths and religions and for distinguishing factual from fictional claims about any divine being, any entity, any spiritual being. And, and it's vital. You can't understand the world's myths and religions. And you can't understand the distinction between factual and fictional claims about God if you don't get personification. Martin Buber, the famous theologian um, uh, back in the mid-20th century, wrote this book called I and Thou. And he talked about the radical difference between having an I-it relationship to reality and an I-thou relationship. And he basically said that if we treat, if we continue to treat nature as an it that we think we can use to our benefit by simply exploiting it, he said, we will cause our own extinction. And yet that's exactly what we've been doing. We've been treating nature as a complex clock because what happened was we invented pendulum clocks back in the, in the, about 600 years ago. And so we started using clocks as our basic metaphor, our basic analogy for reality. The problem is, if you think of nature as a complex clock, it does two things. One is it completely trivializes the notion of God. God is no longer understood as imminent and omnipresent. That is, there's you know, no place that God stops and something else starts. You know, God is no longer thought of as a synonym for reality. God is now thought of as a supernatural being outside a mechanistic cosmos, a, you know, a material mechanistic universe. And so God becomes completely trivialized that you can either believe in this supernatural being or disbelieve in it. But nature becomes desacralized. We no longer relate to nature as a thou to be honored and respected. We now think of nature as an it to be used and exploited by us. And the consequences have been catastrophic. Thomas Berry my great mentor said it this way. He said, the world we live in is an honorable world. To refuse this deepest instinct of our being, to deny honor where honor is due, is to place ourselves on a head-on collision course with the ultimate forces of the universe. He said, this question of honor must be dealt with before any other question. It's ultimately not a political, economic, or even an environmental issue. It's ultimately a question of honor. Only the sense of the violated honor of Earth and the need to restore that honor will awaken in humans the passion and energy needed to co-create a just and healthy future. Gregory Bateson, one of the leading intellectuals of the last 75 years, said it just as powerfully. He said, if you imagine God as outside nature, vis-a-vis -vis nature, and you think of yourself as created in the image of God, you will naturally and inevitably think of yourself as above and outside the things around you. And as you unrightfully claim all mind to yourself, you'll see the world around you as mindless and therefore not entitled to moral or ethical consideration. The world will seem to be yours to exploit. He said, if this is your estimate of your relationship to nature and you have an advanced technology, your likelihood of survival will be that of a snowball in hell. You will die either of the consequences of your own hate or simply from overpopulation and overgrazing. And you can add climate change in there too. Nature is nothing like a complex clock. We are the result of 13.8 billion years of unbroken evolution. We are nature becoming to, coming to know itself. We are the universe becoming aware of itself, literally. There's not a scientist that I know of in the world that would deba debate that. Ludwig Wittgenstein was one of my heroes or one of my mentors, intellectual mentors. I never met him um, in seminary. And he uh, talked about language games. He was one of the most famous philosophers of the 20th century, probably the most famous philosopher. And he loved to piss off other philosophers and theologians because what he said was basically that virtually all theological problems and most philosophical problems are caused because we don't understand the way language works. For example, I'm going to list a whole bunch of words here and try to think about what they have in common. Life, time, wind, breath, reality, nature, climate, universe, and environment. None of these words existed for the Hebrews. None of these concepts existed for the Hebrews. Now, clearly, what we mean by these existed for the Hebrews. But the Hebrew word for time was the same as distance. The Hebrew word for both wind and breath was the Spirit of God. Ruach Adonai, Ruach Elohim. In other words, they had a personal I-thou relationship to what we call the wind or what we call the breath. And you know something? You didn't need to believe in the Spirit of God. You couldn't not experience the Spirit of God. If you're experiencing the wind or if you're experiencing the breath, you're experiencing the Spirit. And you know the only time that the Spirit leaves you is when you die. You don't breathe. This does not have to be understood in an otherworldly or supernatural way. Now, 
whatever life was doing, whatever reality was doing, whatever the climate was doing would have been interpreted. We can't not interpret. That's what our brains do. And how the Hebrews interpreted all this was Yahweh, the Lord. You may think you're the Lord of your life. <laughs> reality is Lord. This is the slide that I just want to spend a little bit of time on because it's the core of what I want to talk about until we get to climate change. The difference between fictional and factual, or you could say the difference between unnatural versus undeniable understandings of any god, any goddess, any divine entity, or whatever. For example, Poseidon was not the god of the oceans. Poseidon was not the spirit of the oceans. Poseidon was a personification of the incomprehensibly powerful and capricious seas. In other words, Harry Potter is a fictional character. I can read about Harry Potter in the literature. I can have an imaginary conversation with Harry Potter in my mind, close my eyes, but I can't experience Harry Potter in the real world with my senses, as it were. Well, if you think of Poseidon as the spirit of the oceans or the god of the oceans, that's fictional. That's unnatural. If you think of, God, of Poseidon as a personification of the seas, that's undeniably real. <laughs> if you're on either coast in the United States, if you're on either coast, it doesn't matter whether you believe in the oceans or not. The oceans are inescapably real. In fact, here's another example of Hollywood getting with it and, and uh, Conservation International. Imagine this as, as what Poseidon might be talking to us, telling us, speaking to us today. I am the ocean. I'm water. I'm most of this planet. I shaped it. Every stream, every cloud, and every raindrop, it all comes back to me. One way or another, every living thing here needs me. I'm the source. I'm what they crawled out of. Humans, they're no different. I don't owe them a thing. I give. They take, but I can always take back. That's just the way it's always been. It's not their planet anyway. Never was, never will be. But humans, they take more than their share. They poison me, then they expect me to feed them. Well, it doesn't work that way. If humans want to exist in nature with me, and off of me. I suggest they listen close. I'm only going to say this once. If nature isn't kept healthy, humans won't survive. Simple as that. Me, I could give a damn with or without humans. I'm the ocean. I covered this entire planet once, and I can always cover it again. That's all I have to say. So again, I recommend all of the videos on the Nature is Speaking uh, website. The same thing could be said for any god or any goddess or any divine being or entity throughout human history. Helios was not the god of the sun or the spirit of the sun. Helios was a personification of what we call the sun. You didn't find atheists living two or three thousand years ago saying, I don't believe in Helios. <laughs> Whatever you mean by this big ball of flame and light that gives us life, that's what I'm talking about. Gaia was not the goddess of the earth or the spirit of the earth. Gaia was a personification of what we call earth. Eros was a personification of love or lust, not the spirit of love or lust. And one of the reasons why the ancients spoke about the immortality of the gods is that humans are born, humans die, humans come, humans go. Lust is always there. Gaia is always there. Helios is always there. Poseidon is always there. From our vantage point, these are eternal. And again, don't take my word on it, please. Google any of these terms, anthropomorphism, deities, personification. Gods, goddesses, personify. In fact, you can take put gods, goddesses, personify, and put Aztec, China, 
India, Greece, Rome, any, any, any place after that, and you'll find dozens of web pages and all the various gods and goddesses and what aspect of our inner reality or our outer reality, or in some cases both, that god or goddess personified. And notice the radical difference between believing in Gaia and honoring Gaia, between worshiping Poseidon and respecting Poseidon. See, this is what Wittgenstein was getting at. Language trips us up. And this book, Faces in the Clouds by Stuart Guthrie, A New Theory of Religion, it was written in 1994, Oxford University Press. Fabulous book. I highly recommend this book. And it's now one of the foundational texts in an entire research discipline called Evolutionary Religious Studies. There's like a hundred or more scholars working in this field. Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, atheist scholars all trying to understand uh, religion from our best evidential understanding from a lot of different disciplines. See, a factual view of God transcends belief or disbelief. It doesn't matter whether we, whether we believe in reality or not. Reality is something that every plant, every animal, and every human being cannot not experience inwardly and outwardly. That's why I love this quote from Philip K. Dick. He says, reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. And I think there's at least three things, maybe more, but there's at least three things that we can say confidently are real to that degree. Time is real whether we believe it or not. 13.8 billion years of the past brought this moment into being. Clearly, the present moment is real, and if we act as if the future is not real, we will condemn future generations. So time is real. Nature is real. Our inner nature, our outer nature, our social nature, and our interpretive nature. Nature is real, real whether we believe it or not. But so is mystery. And I'm not just talking about what people refer to when they speak of the transcendence. Yes, it includes that. But I'm speaking about everything that we don't know and everything that we don't even know that we don't know. So whatever else the word God means, as an evolutionary theologian, what I'm meaning by it is nothing less than a personification, a personal name for time, nature, and mystery. Reality personified. In fact, Thomas Aquinas, one of the Christian church's greatest theologians, said 750 years ago, he said, a mistake about creation will necessarily result in a mistake about God. Now, if that's true, what it means, among other things, is the more we learn about the nature of the universe, the nature of creation, if we're not updating what we mean when we even use the word God, we may have definitions and understandings of God that are so outdated they may no longer be life-giving. In fact, they may be deadly. So I've been speaking a lot, and others too, about ecology as the new theology. And this is obvious when we think about it. What I mean is that any notion of theology that doesn't include ecology is trivial and impotent. It, it's, just, it's not for the times. Think about this. Every characteristic that we attribute to the divine derives from our experience of nature. If we imagine God as beautiful, gracious, loving, awesome, powerful, majestic, or faithful, it is because we have known or experienced beauty, grace, love, awe, power, majesty, or trustworthiness in the world. If we lived on the moon, and that's all we and our ancestors had ever known, all of our concepts and experience of the divine would reflect the barrenness of the lunar landscape. Now see, this is obvious when we think about it. We're just not used to thinking in these terms. A few months ago, I preached at one of the most famous buildings in the world, actually in the top 100 famous buildings, Frank Lloyd Wright's Unity Temple in Chicago, um, which is Unitarian Universalist Church now. I love this quote. He says, I believe in God, only I spell it N-A-T-U-R-E. Now again, remember, the word nature didn't exist two or 3,000 years ago, okay? This is not merely pantheism. Pantheism emerged in 1709. It was coined, that term, by uh, John Tolland as a, as a confront, as, in a way, as a way of countering this mechanistic worldview, thinking of nature as a complex clock. Thomas Berry has this amazing quote. He says, all human activities, programs, policies, and institutions must henceforth be judged primarily by the extent to which they inhibit, ignore, or foster a mutually enhancing human-earth relationship. I mean, if you want, in one nutshell, sort of our vision of the future, the only way into a healthy future, it would be this sentence, in my opinion. See, theology that includes ecology is pro-future. Theology that doesn't include ecology is anti-future. And I think this is one of the fundamental distinctions going into the future. Whether you know your institution, whether your religion, whether your theology or doctrine of this or that or the other thing, is it pro-future or anti-future? Is our, our, is our economics pro-future or anti-future? Is our way of doing governance pro-future or anti-future? Now, I'm going to use both secular and religious 
uh, names, uh, and you're going to see both are legitimate. You can't understand how reality or God created complex life if you don't understand extinctions. You can't understand how reality or God created uh, the Great Lakes or soil, healthy soil in the northern part of the world if you don't understand glaciers. You can't understand how reality or God created the periodic table of elements or planets or life or even the atoms of our bodies if you don't understand red giants and supernova explosions. Watch this photo carefully. You surely can't understand how God or reality created continents and oceans and mountains if you don't understand plate tectonics. See, we've only known about plate tectonics. We don't believe that the Atlantic Ocean is growing at the same rate that our fingernails grow. We know it. We've got the satellites to measure exactly how fast the Atlantic Ocean is growing and how fast the Pacific Ocean is shrinking. And we've only known about extinction for 210 years, for glaciers for like 170 years, um, supernovas for maybe uh, 75 years, and uh, plate tectonics for like 65 years. See, this is revelation, but it's evidential revelation. Evidence is how God or reality is speaking to us today. Evidence should be considered modern-day scripture. It's our main source of divine guidance today. Scientific evidence, historic evidence, and cross-cultural evidence. See, anytime, any tradition, any culture, any scripture, anywhere in the world says God said this or God did that, what follows is always an interpretive personification. We know of no counterexamples in the history of humanity. And it's only our inability to read mythic literature that's made us blind and deaf to what God or reality has been revealing now for centuries through evidence. I mean, you know, you open up the book of Amos or any Old Testament prophet and it says, thus saith the Lord. And you've got two paragraphs. And it sounds like, if you just take it literally, that, you know, somebody was there with a tape recorder catching some voice booming from the sky. But it wasn't like that at all. If you could go back in time like a time machine and, you know, record the moment of divine revelation for the nightly news, you'd see some old guy sitting at a table penning himself or dictating to a scribe what he saw was real, what he sensed was emerging, and then speaking a word of warning to the people that was basically, folks, we need to get right with God or else. We need to get right with reality or we will perish. That's the fundamental stance of a prophet. But we're not going to see, we're not even going to be aware of who are the prophets alive today if we think these prophets were people channeling some otherworldly entity or predicting the future. God is a mythic or sacred or I-thou name for reality, that is time, nature, mystery, as it truly is, a meaningful interpretation. God is a supremely natural personification of reality, not a supernatural being who merely created reality. Said another way, God is reality with a personality, not a person outside reality. In fact, all gods and goddesses are personifications, not persons. And as I'll often say in my evening programs at this point, please, no whining. Because often devout religious people and anti-religious people start whining in the opposite direction. It's like sometimes theists and, and devout religious people will say, well, wait a second, are you saying that my God is only a personification? Well, no, not entirely, because whatever reality is in its essence includes mystery. It will always transcend anything we can know, think, or imagine. But yes, I am saying that anything we can say or think about God is a personification. But atheists start whining often in the opposite direction. They'll say, well, wait a second, if this is true, then my argument that God doesn't exist just kind of evaporates. Well, unfortunately, that is true. But as long as there are theists and religious people who by the word God, they mean a supernatural terrorist who says basically, believe as I tell you to believe or be tortured forever, you're probably going to have the need for some atheists who say that's a bunch of bunk. And again, don't take my word on it. Google any of these terms, anthropomorphism, deities personification, gods, goddesses personify. Read the book Faces in the Clouds by Stuart Guthrie. And, or just Google the term evolutionary religious studies. There have been a couple of New York Times bestselling books that have come out of this. In fact, Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, his, his New York Times bestselling book, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Differ on Politics and Religion, comes out of this discipline. I believe that one of the great collective insanities today is the current theism versus atheism debate. You've got tens of thousands, maybe millions of people that are wasting their time arguing whether or not God is real or whether or not God exists when the one real God, namely reality, nature, time, personified or not, we've been out of right relationship to. We are betraying the future. We are betraying nature. We are betraying mystery. And yet you got thousands of people, maybe millions of people that are arguing whether or not God exists. And here's the thing, because we've been out of right relationship to reality, we're about to experience consequences of biblical proportion. 
Now, evangelicals will often speak of, do you, you know, they'll ask, do you have a personal relationship to God? Well, I think it's a great question, but if we don't have a personal and honorable relationship to time, an honorable relationship to nature, and an honorable relationship to mystery, we don't have a personal relationship to God, and I don't care what our beliefs are. I mean, if you don't have an honorable relationship to time, nature, and mystery, don't tell me about your beliefs. You don't have a personal relationship to God. And let me speak about it in the opposite. A dishonorable relationship to time is if you think time only goes back a few thousand years, or you think, who cares about the future? Jesus is coming back. That's a dishonoring of time. A dishonorable relationship to nature is when you think we can continue to use the air, the water, or the soil as a garbage can. And a dishonorable relationship to mystery is if you think your tradition has all the answers for everything. So coming back to these two fundamental questions, what's real? That is how things are. And what's important? Which things matter? Religion 1.0 is the authority of elders. It's the collective intelligence at the tribal level. It's before we had writing. Our stories of what's real and what's important would have naturally morphed and evolved and shifted and changed through time. A religion 2.0 is when we start writing these down, which we've only had for 5,000 years writing. In fact, most of the scriptures of the world are a lot less than that. But it's the authority of collective intelligence, the groups of people, in this case usually men, who decided which books were in and which books were out. I mean, for example, in the Christian tradition, you know, you had these bishops uh, that in the 3rd and 4th centuries that were trying to decide of all these gospels and letters and epistles, which ones were authentic, which ones felt true. This was collective intelligence. The problem is, whereas religion 1.0, these stories about what's real and what's important, could have shifted and morphed over time until they de get declared the unchanging word of God. Then they can't evolve. The only thing that can, can evolve is our interpretation of the stories. Religion 3.0 is the authority of global collective intelligence. You've got the collective intelligence of elders, the collective intelligence of the groups of people that decided who, what was scripture and what wasn't. And in this case, it's the collective intelligence, religion 3.0, of global collective intelligence, the, the, the authority of evidence. Now, this doesn't mean that religion 3.0, the evidential reformation is what I often call it, that we should ignore the wisdom of elders or that we should ignore the wisdom of scripture. Not at all. But we should never allow the wisdom of a small group of elders or even a large group of elders, or the wisdom of Scripture to, to supersede, to, to, uh, to be held higher or more important than the authority of global collective intelligence, what God is revealing through evidence. And there's a cost. There's a suffering when we do. Now, if you're an atheist or a humanist, you're not going to be suffering with these things. But if you're a religious, religious person like I am, these are going to be a little bit painful. Youth are abandoning their parents' faith in record numbers I read a, a survey recently that 1,200 people a day in America leave the church and don't come back. And most of them are young people, and when you ask them why, the conflict with religion is one of the top reasons. The new atheists are mocking religion, and many of them are doing so by promoting Bible study. I'll come back to that here in a minute. The highest rates of teen pregnancy, alcoholism, spouse abuse, and porn addiction are in the most Bible-believing parts of the United States. And evangelicals are being left behind. They're, be, they're in denial of factual revelation regarding big history. There was a poll just a few months ago that talked about 77% of evangelicals deny a 13.8 billion year universe. 76% deny evolution. And 58% of evangelicals deny the reality of climate change. This is a huge voting block. And I believe that climate is the single greatest moral issue in human history. And there's many people that are coming. In fact, recently the Vatican said one of the same said the same thing. Uh, Connie was just telling me about that this morning. And Connie and I had our climate change come to Jesus moment about two years ago. David Roberts in December of because uh, I'm recording this in December, December of 2012. We watched David Roberts TEDx talk called "Climate Change is Simple." And I encourage you. I used to show this in my programs, but I, I stopped doing that when we when I included the. Uh, Conservation International um, uh, uh, videos, but I, I strongly encourage people to go and watch the remix. Remix is where it was added. There was some music added to it, and, and just watch that video. It's, it's very powerful. Basically, climate change went from the back burner to the front burner for us, and it's going to remain that way. We have an email newsletter that we put out uh, about four, four or five times a year called Evolutionary Times. This is our main website, thegreatstory.org. And, um, and that, that 
TEDx talk by David Roberts, plus a lot of other science-based videos, some of the best science educational videos on climate change you can find right there on our website on climate science. Now, the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the largest and most prestigious science body in the world, just came out just a few months ago with an uncharacteristically prophetic What We Know campaign. And I say prophetic. It was. And based on scientific papers, for example, published between 2001 and 2012, 97% of climate scientists agree that climate change is real, humans are the main cause, and we must take immediate action to avoid condemning our children and grandchildren to a literal hell and high water. Now that was up till 2012. If you look at from November 2012 to December 2013, we're now talking about 99.9% .9 of the climate scientists that are publishing are agreeing on that. Now, if you poll Americans and you ask Americans, do you think that the scientific community is divided on this issue? 40% of Americans say that, yes, they think the science community is divided. How is that possible? Well, my mother's favorite news outlet is one of the reasons. But this book here, Merchants of Doubt, by Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway, the subtitle is How a Handful of Scientists Obscured the Truth on Issues from Tobacco Smoke to Global Warming. This book uncovers the face of evil today. If the word evil can mean anything in a modern context, it's got to mean those who are pursuing their own benefit, their own wealth, in, and destroying the future, harming the future in that process. And here's the thing. We now know that the tobacco industry had proof. They knew. We have internal documents that they knew in 1962 that their product caused cancer, emphysema, and other problems as well. And yet they successfully confused the issue the issue, uh, over, over the course of 50 years to avoid the kind of um, regulations that would be not in their financial self-interest. Well, now those same scientists and those same PR companies are working, and guess who they're working for? Coal, oil, and gas. And uh, as I said, I think this is the face of evil today. I consider Bill McKibben a modern-day prophet. He says, it's simple math. We can burn less than 565 more gigatons of carbon dioxide and stay below 2 degrees Celsius of warming. Anything more than that risks catastrophe for life on Earth. The only problem, fossil fuel corporations now have 2,795 gigatons in their reserves, five times the safe amount, and they're planning to burn it all unless we rise up to stop them. See, prophets aren't people channeling another worldly entity or predicting the future. Prophets are people speaking on behalf of reality and doing so with unflinching authority. I consider James Hansen a modern-day prophet. Here, one of the most respected scientists in the world on climate has been now repeatedly arrested. And when I say repeatedly, I mean repeatedly! <laughs> And when you let me look at the bottom left picture there, he's got a smile on his face. He knows these guys now. And when you ask him why this level of activism, he himself says why. It's his grandchildren. And one of the best books on climate change, Storms of My Grandchildren, The Truth About the Coming Climate Catastrophe and Our Last Chance to Save Humanity. Here he is with Amy Goodman for about 40 seconds on Democracy Now. These, these protests are what do we call civil resistance, uh, in the same way that Gandhi did. We're trying to draw attention to the injustice, because this, this is really analogous. This, this is a moral issue, analogous to that faced by Lincoln with slavery or by Churchill with uh, Nazism. Because what we have here is a tremendous case of intergenerational injustice, because we are causing the problem, but our children and grandchildren are going to suffer the consequences. And our parents didn't know that they were causing a problem for future generations, but we do. The science has become very clear, and we're going to have to move to a clean energy future. And we could do that, and there would be many other advantages of doing it. Why don't we do it? Because of the special interests and because of the role of money in Washington. See, that's one of the reasons why campaign finance reform is so vital. Now, when I speak of the evidential reformation, I'm talking about something that actually is impacting every religion in the world. It's going to, be, it's going to make the Protestant Reformation look puny in comparison because it's all about evidence as modern-day scripture, and it's impacting every religion in the world. In fact, here's a core insight from this understanding that reality is Lord, reality is God, facts are God's native tongue, and if we don't come into right relationship with God, reality, nature soon, we are condemning our children and grandchildren to hell. Not another worldly mythic hell, a literal hell. 
Now, people always want to know, what can I do? What can we do? Well, there's a number of things. We can all change our light bulbs and drive less and fly less and, you know, start growing some of our food. I mean, there's many, many things that we can do individually. But there's one major systemic thing. And, you know, I encourage... Uh, Al Gore's Climate Reality Leadership Corps, 350.org, highly recommend. And CarbonTax.org and EnergyEnterprise.com and Citizens Climate Lobby are all focused on the same one thing, which is we have to put a fair price on carbon pollution. We can no longer allow the free or subsidized polluting of the commons. It's insane to do that. And, uh, and so uh, I've been recommending people, everybody can get involved. I mean, whatever individual thing, that's fine. But get involved in Citizens Climate Lobby. Get involved in some of these organizations, Sierra Club and other things as well. But definitely check out carbontax.org. And I highly recommend, especially to people who on the conservative end, politically or religiously, energyandenterprise.com. In fact, one of my heroes, literally, is a Republican in South Carolina, Bob Inglis. He's, the, he's with energyandenterprise.com. And um, uh, uh, here's a quote that just nails it. He says, I favor a conservative approach that marshals the power of the market and doesn't increase the size of government. Here it is in a nutshell. Put all the costs in all the fuels and eliminate all the subsidies and then watch the free enterprise system solve the energy and climate problem. Bam! He nails it. That's exactly what all the leaders in the climate change movement say we, say we have to do. It's the one systemic thing. Because what this does is it marshals the entire power of the market to help all of us move in the right direction. It begins to create a system so that the cheaper, easier, more convenient thing to do is the right thing to do. Right now, the cheaper, easier, more convenient thing to do is usually the wrong thing to do. And it's important. That's why James Hansen calls this a uh, revenue-neutral fee and dividend. It's not just taxes that go into the government. It gets uh, refunded to citizens so that people on the lower end of the, uh, of the socioeconomic uh, brackets uh, aren't unfairly disadvantaged. Now watch. Here it is. This is not projection. This is the last 62 years. Okay? This is fact. And notice that the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the average. 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000. 2012. That was the last 62 years. It's now picking up steam. So coming back to these painful questions, again, if you're a humanist or an atheist, they may, these won't be painful to you, but they are painful to many of us religious people. Why is the most prosperous and Christian nation filled with genuinely good people betraying the future? Why is traditional religion shrinking in the West and secularism growing so rapidly? I mean, look, at these are the liberal churches. This is the Catholic seminaries, but this is the Southern Baptists. It's not just the liberals. Why are some of the new atheists excitedly promoting Bible study? I mean, P.Z. Myers, he's the most widely read science blogger in the world. 50,000 people every day read this guy's science blogs. And, and this is a direct quote. He says, there's no surer way to make an atheist than to get them to actually read, actually read the Bible. How can he say that? Well, because they focus on the gruesome passages. For example, if you take a straightforward, crass reading of the morality of the Old Testament, you could sum it up as, obey the Lord or die. In the New Testament, it's believe in Jesus or fry. And yet our own government defines terrorism this way. The United States Department of Defense defines terrorism as the calculated use of violence or the threat of violence to inculcate fear, intended to coerce or intimidate others in the pursuit of goals that are generally religious, political, or ideological. Now, the good news, if you're a religious person, is that God is not a cosmic terrorist. Mike Earl, Bible stories your parents never taught you. Tens of thousands of people are going from being devoutly religious to atheists. They're just bypassing liberal Christianity. They're becoming atheists because of this guy's Bible stories your parents never taught you. Volume 1 is the Old Testament. Volume 2 is the New Testament. It's all free. It's audio recorded. It's, you can download it to your iPod. You can watch it on YouTube. Bible stories your parents never taught you. I've never known anybody to be able to watch or listen to the Old Testament and New Testament, Volume 1 and 2, and, and remain a biblical literalist. It just rocks people out of literalism. These are atheists excitedly promoting Bible study. Why are rates of teen pregnancy, alcoholism, domestic violence, and porn addiction highest in the parts of America where the vast majority claim that they're saved from their sin? I mean, I did a, my first TEDx talk that I did two years ago, uh, back in 2012, uh, called Why We Struggle and Suffer Now. It was on evolutionary psychology and brain science. 
And, you know, because anybody who believes that the reason that we're tempted by various things is because our great, 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 great grandmother ate an apple is going to be clueless about how to live in integrity. When I speak in Christian context, living in Christ, in integrity, it's the only way to have freedom. Well, I had three evangelicals come up to me because Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is where this was done, is a very conservative part of the world. And I had, within a two and a half hour period uh, after my program, I had three evangelicals come up to me independently. And all three of them said basically the same thing, which was, I was a young earth, young earth creationist until I heard your program. Now I've just got to accept evolution. I've just got to do it in a God-honoring way. In fact, one young man, he was probably in his mid-20s, he said, I always thought that evolution was about Darwin, DNA, and dinosaurs. I didn't know it was about how to live a more Christ-like life and have healthier relationships. See, this is the practical side of an evolutionary worldview. And then finally, why have biblical literalists been on the wrong side of history regarding most factual and moral issues over the past 500 years? Well, I think all five of these questions can be answered by one painful cartoon. Onward, steed in search of truth, Bible tucked under the elbow, going the wrong way. That's why I encourage every minister, every priest, and every rabbi to subscribe to Science News. It comes out once a week. It's a best short encapsulated, really well-written summaries of, of what I call God's evidential revelation. That's what's being revealed about reality through evidence. And I encourage everybody, every minister and priest, to preach from evidential revelation at least once a season, if not once a month or more often. I think young people will come back into the churches. In fact, the denomination that I pastored three churches in, the United Church of Christ, many liberal traditions value the, the Jesus Seminar, this 19th and 20th century liberal scholarship. Um, you know, They did the fine work, the important, the necessary work of the deconstruction of biblical idolatry. But what we now need is the constructive work and the United Church of Christ has had this slogan now for the last, I think, 12 or 13 years called God is still speaking, comma, and all this emphasis on the comma, you know, don't put a, don't put a period where God puts a comma and all this stuff. And you know something? You know what's happened to the United Church of Christ over the last 12, 15 years? It's continued to shrink. And I think it's going to continue until we finish the sentence with an exclamation point. God is still speaking, comma, and facts are God's native tongue. If we preach with that kind of thing, young people will find the church relevant again. See, a factual view of God in Revelation calls forth boldly pro-science, pro-future prophetic speech. Now, you could say that I'm kind of being redundant there. All prophetic speech is pro-future. Here, I want to introduce you to a, uh, a modern-day prophet, a poet, a friend of mine, Drew Dillinger, and a poem of his. Because we need to engage the artists, the storytellers, the musicians, the poets, the music, you know, the, 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 the playwrights. This is what grabs our hearts, the various art forms. Here's a poem, a prophetic poem. This poem is called Hieroglyphic Stairway. It's 3.23 in the morning, and I'm awake because my great, great, grandchildren won't let me sleep. My great, great grandchildren ask me in dreams, what did you do while the planet was plundered? What did you do when the earth was unraveling? Surely you did something when the season started failing, as the mammals, reptiles, birds were all dying. Did you fill the streets with protest when democracy was stolen, what did you do once you knew? I'm riding home on the coma train. I've got the voice of the Milky Way in my dreams. I have teams of scientists feeding me data daily and pleading I immediately turn it into poetry. I want just this consciousness reached by people in range of secret frequencies contained in my speech. I am the desirous Earth equidistant to the underworld and the flesh of the stars. I am everything already lost. The moment the universe turns transparent and all the light shoots through the cosmos, I use words to instigate silence. I'm a hieroglyphic stairway in a buried Mayan city, suddenly exposed by a hurricane, a satellite circling Earth, finding dinosaur bones in the Gobi Desert, I am telescopes that see back in time. It's 3.23 in the morning, and I can't sleep because my great, great grandchildren ask me in dreams, 
What did you do while the earth was unraveling? I want just this consciousness reached by people in range of secret frequencies contained in my speech. It's not just my great, great, great grandchildren. All I have to do is look into my granddaughter's eyes. She is the future calling me to greatness. We are in the midst of what I think will be known eventually as the Great Reckoning. That is where humanity has been out of right relationship to reality and we're now about to experience consequences of biblical proportion. Hopefully it will also be the Great Homecoming. The prodigal species, we've squandered our inheritance, we're waking up to our predicament in the pig pen, as it were, and coming home to God, to reality. What I'm about to say is going to make what I've said up till now fairly tame in comparison, so brace yourself. Obsolete and impotent notions of God and God's word are killing us, shrinking the church, destroying the world, and condemning our children and grandchildren to hell on earth. Just when religion's moral guidance and righteous reverence for life has been most needed, it's been most absent. Why? Because the church has been blind and deaf to what God has been revealing for centuries now, largely because of what I call the triple idolatries, idolatry of the written word, idolatry of the otherworldly, and idolatry of beliefs. And yes, I know this is very politically incorrect to, to speak this way, and yet I have to. And I want to be, make sure that I'm not misunderstood. By idolatry, I don't mean anything so goofy and trivial as bowing down to statues or rocks. By idolatry, I mean making your ultimate commitment, your primary concern, something that doesn't deserve to be or that betrays and defiles the future. Idolatry of the written word is when you think God's best guidance, that is our best map of reality, is frozen in time in some ancient text. Idolatry of the other world is where you think where God resides is only outside time and nature. And idolatry of beliefs is when you think any one belief system is the only one right way to right relationship to reality. See, good people are dangerous, and great people can engage in great evil when their map of reality is outdated or when they privilege ancient mythic texts over current evidential revelation. And see, this matters societally also, not just these five questions I had before. I mean, you know, it's not a surprise that America is not leading the world with regards to our response to climate. Because 41% of Americans believe that these are the end times anyway, so why bother? I mean, there's no sense of commitment to, to what the world will be like 100 years or 1,000 years from now if you think that Jesus is coming back in the next 20, 30 years. This notion that the past is rooting for us. I mean, of all the tens of thousands of things that will give your life meaning throughout the course of your life, now obviously I'm speaking mythically, I'm personifying the past, but of everything that will give your life meaning over the course of your life, the final meaning of your life is your legacy. So the past is rooting for us. This may be one of the most important and useful belief systems. Again, not belief like it's the truth, but it's useful truth. The past is rooting for us. And the future is calling us to greatness. I mean, these fundamental moral categories, good, bad, great, evil, these fundamental moral categories have always in all cultures been defined by how we impact others and how that ripples out to the future. I mean, if I do something helpful to, to you or to others or the future, I've done a good thing. If I harm others or harm the future, I've done a bad thing. If I sacrifice in order to be a blessing to others or the future, I've done a great thing or a heroic thing. But if I self-centeredly serve my own needs, screw others to hell with the future, I've done an evil thing. This is not moral rocket science. We don't need Ten Commandments to tell us this. I'm going to put up a word here that I'm willing to bet most people will never have heard. Usufruct. I consider it one of the most important words in the English language. Thomas Jefferson used it all the time. And it's, it's, a, it's an indictment of our culture that we don't understand what it means. Usufruct is the ability to use, to benefit from, to enjoy land, uh, anything natural, and even, even to, uh, to profit from it, but not in a way that it diminishes it for future generations or destroys it in any way. We've been in radical violation of usufruct. See, the future owns the land. We don't. You could say God owns the land. Reality does. The future does. So I'm going to be as bold as I can be here. And I'm not channeling another worldly entity and I'm not predicting the future. I'm suggesting that if we give reality a voice, what is reality saying to us today? You tell me in your own heart whether you think God, reality, is saying these things. Facts are my native tongue. Honor evidence as scripture. Repent of your idolatries or face hell and high water. 
I preached a sermon at a large Unitarian church just outside of um, uh, Denver. And um, uh, the title of the sermon was God Rebukes the Religious Right, Repent or Face Hell in High Water. It was a climate change sermon. And I, they gave me a standing ovation, which didn't surprise me at a Unitarian church. But I preached that same sermon, God Rebukes the Religious Right, Repent or Face Hell in High Water, at a Baptist church in Houston, Texas. And they gave me a standing ovation. That, I burst into tears. I was not expecting that at all. Nature is my secular name. Obey my laws or perish. Abandon apocalyptic thinking. It is an abomination. I mean, a book uh, that was written uh, not long ago, a couple years ago, by John Michael Greer. He's literally my favorite author in the world. I've read nine of his books. Uh, Connie and I just love this guy's writings. Apocalypse Not is one of them. Everything you know about 2012, Nostradamus, and the rapture is wrong. It's the 3,200-year history of end times thinking and the tragedy and the suffering that has resulted from people who believe that the end of the world was right around the corner, both secular and religious people. And interestingly enough, completely independent of this, uh, Brian Paisley in, in Canadian television did virtually the same thing, the same 3,200-year study of end times thinking and the tragedies. And Paisley never heard about John Michael Greer, and nor has John Michael Greer heard about Paisley. I mean, I've since introduced them to each other. But um, fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Purge plutocracy, that is where money rules government. Purge plutocracy and end corporate personhood. Stop polluting the commons. Tax carbon now. And then stop measuring success in insane evil ways. And again, the word evil I'm meaning when you know that you're benefiting but harming the future in the process. The way we've been measuring success is, is collective insanity. In fact, here's a prophet from, uh, from 40 years ago. Too much and for too long, we seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community value in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product now is over $800 billion a year. But that gross national product, if we judge the United States of America by that, that gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwoods and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic sprawl. It counts napalm and it counts nuclear warheads and armored cars for the fleet to fight the riots in our cities. It counts Whitman's rifle and Spex knife and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry, or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And it can tell us everything about America, except why we are proud that we are Americans. So I can say the good news, according to science, the gospel, according to science, around climate change, I mean, I can do a whole program. I have done a whole, whole program on this topic. But around climate change, I can say the good news in five words. We can see it coming. Never before in the history of the entire world, not just our species, never before in global history has any species been able to see a potential extinction level event coming in time to prepare for what we is already baked in the system and to ward off the worst of it. That's good news. Carl Sagan said this very powerfully. He said, how is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded, this is better than we thought. The universe is much bigger than our prophets said, grander, subtler, more elegant. God must be even greater than we dreamed. 
A religion old or new that stressed the magnificence of the universe as revealed by modern science might be able to draw forth reserves of reverence and awe hardly tapped by the conventional faiths. Sooner or later, he suggested, such a religion will emerge. Now, I believe he was correct in the intuition, but dead wrong in the detail, because it's not a religion that's emerging. It's a set of values, priorities, and commitments. A worldwide meta-religious movement has been emerging for decades, largely unnoticed at the nexus, at the intersection of science, inspiration, and sustainability. In fact, beliefs are secondary. What unites us is a pool of common values, priorities, and commitments regarding living in right relationship to reality, whether we use religious or secular names for reality, and working together in the service of a just and thriving future for all. And this isn't just me saying this. Paul Hawken, in a New York, New York Times bestselling book, Blessed Unrest, how the largest social movement in history is restoring grace, justice, and beauty to the world. I actually like the, uh, the title of the, the subtitle, that is, of the hardcover better how the largest movement in the world came into being and why no one saw it coming. And that's what this conversation series that I've been doing also throughout 2014, I've been interviewing literally the cream of the crop, some of the top experts in the world on climate change, peak oil and resource depletion, sustainability, and how to hold all this scary stuff in ways that inspire us to work together across ethnic, religious, and political divides so that we can, so that we can ensure a just and healthy future. I also did a series back four or five years ago on the advent of evolutionary Christianity, where I interviewed literally the, the cream of the crop in terms of Christians, the most respected, you know, scientists, theologians, ministers, I mean, the top Catholics, the top Protestants, the top evangelicals. And what we all agreed on, this is the interesting thing, we have lots of differences. I mean, some major differences. Some of us are conservative, some are liberal, some are naturalists, some are supernaturalists. But what we all agreed on was these fundamental things. We all had deep time eyes, that is an evolutionary understanding of reality. We all had a global heart and a global commitment. That is, our commitment wasn't just to our own soul salvation or our own religious group or our own nation state, but our commitment was really to the health and well-being of the entire body of life of which we're a part. And we all valued evidence as in some very real sense divine revelation. Some felt comfortable, like I do, calling it modern-day scripture. Others didn't feel comfortable with that language. But we all agreed on these fundamental things. So the book I'm working on now, I don't know what the final title will be, but I'm playing with you know Religion 3.0 or Reality is Lord. Basically, religion as if the future mattered. Sacred science, evolving faith, saving humanity. And I'm suggesting that these six principles unite tens of millions of us around the world. Reality is our God. Evidence is our scripture. Big history is our creation story. Ecology is our theology. Integrity is our spiritual path. And ensuring a just and healthy future is our mission. Now, you don't have to use this combination. You could say, if you're a secular person, reality is my ultimate commitment. Evidence is the main way reality reveals itself, and so on. Um, or if you're a conservative religious person, you might not frame it this way. You might say it this way, that my God includes reality. My scripture includes evidence. My theology includes ecology, and so on. No matter what our attempts to inform, it is our ability to inspire that will turn the tides. Now, I'm almost six foot one. I'm six foot and about a half inch. These guys are, are tall. The guy on the left is John Mather. He's NASA's senior astrophysicist. He's the 2006 Nobel Prize winner in physics. The guy on the right is Craig Mello. He's the 2006 Nobel Prize winner in medicine and physiology. The reason that they invited me to the Library of Congress is they both had read my book, and they were doing a program together there called The Origins and Evolution of Life in the Universe. And Craig sent me an email, and he said, Michael, you got to come to the Library of Congress and get your picture taken with us. He said, it'll be great for your book. <laughs> you bet I got there. Here's what they said about my book. John Mather said, the universe took 13.7 billion years to produce this amazing book. I hardly recommend it. <laughs> Trust me, as an author, it just doesn't get any better than that. Craig Mello said, the science versus religion debate is over. A must read for all including scientists. Now, this never did get me on Oprah, but I did have a meeting with the uh, vice president and the executive producer of the Oprah Network about the possibility of creating a show called Soulful Science. So we'll see, but we did create an 80-second book trailer. I wanted to share that with you.
As I mentioned before, thegreatstory.org is our favorite, uh, not our favorite, I mean, it's, it's our main website. Uh, Connie Barlow, my wife, is the webmaster. And most of the stuff that we have is linked from there or can be found there. In fact, the climate uh, science videos, I want to again point that out. Um, but also, uh, what is the great story is a fabulous connection to some of the best videos and, and audio tech stuff in terms of whole, what's called big history, what the academic concept of, of uh, discipline of big history or the epic of evolution, the universe story is the way Brian Swim and Thomas Berry talked about it. Um, what's new? All the stuff that we've added since 2004, I think, uh, Connie has annotated so you can get a good overview of the entire website from the What's New page. The evolutionary psychology and brain science stuff, all the practical spirituality uh, kind of stuff uh, can be found there. Um, kids curricula. If you work with kids or have kids or grandkids, Connie has uh, co either created or assembled from others some of the best stuff for kids there. Death. Uh, we, Connie does, we, in fact, we've both done a whole bunch of programs on death and mortality from a sacred science perspective. Lots of great stuff there. Um, we have YouTube channels. Uh, we have podcasts. We have three different podcasts. Um, everything that we've done is, is linked pretty much from our bio pages, so you can find a lot of stuff on either one of our bio and resource pages. And the, one of the big projects I've worked on recently is God in Big History, and Connie's major project is called Climate, Trees, and Legacy. So we're always looking for writing retreats. So if you have a second home or vacation home and you wouldn't mind us house-sitting, please let me know. My email address is michael at thankgodforevolution.com. And we also... Obviously, we appreciate donations. That's what allows us to do free programs we, we, uh, we, when we work with uh, high school and college students and that sort of thing. And you can donate right there. And again, that's our website, thegreatstory.org. Thank you.